familiar to you, you have to draw back in your memory somewhat. We've, we're in Mark 12 on Sunday mornings now, so Mark 1 is some, some time ago. But uh, we went through this. And what we're going to look at tonight is Jesus modeling for the disciples. He's, he's teaching them, but he doesn't say, okay, it's time to teach them. It's time for me to teach you. Sit down and let's learn. No, he is modeling them uh, in the way. Uh, and he's going to touch on uh, three of the five uh, key functions of the church. Uh, in case you're, you've forgotten what those are. Uh, those are worship, uh, the word, prayer, witnessing, and fellowship. Worship what you do privately, small groups as families, and corporately as the people of God. Uh, he's going to take them to a worship service. We're going to see this in a few minutes. And then the Word, he's going to teach. And his teaching was unlike anything folks had ever heard. We're going to look at that. He's going to pray. He's going to model prayer for them at a time when it would have been Illogical, and we're going to see this, that they weren't quite sure why, why he was praying when he was praying. Uh, and then witnessing as he, as he takes them other places. And then the fellowship they experience with him day and night, 24-7. So we're going, to, we're going to see these things in play. And what he's doing is he's modeling this for his disciples. He's, he's going to show it to them. They're going to catch it. And then... It shouldn't surprise us when we get through a passage like this that when he was about to depart and giving the great commission, he said to them literally, if we could read it from the Greek, as you go, because that's how he taught them, was as he went, as you go, disciple the nation. So let's, let's read Mark 1, 21 to 39. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would as I read God's word. Again, familiar verses to you. And they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they took hold they, they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. The whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. We have just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. If we're going to be disciples who make disciples. We've got a major on the fundamentals, and that's what these are. That's what these are. Sometimes we, we think, you know, we've, we've been Christians so long we move beyond. We never move beyond worship, the word, prayer, witnessing, fellowship. Please be seated. Well, They've seen some amazing things already with Jesus. They've heard some amazing things. 
his very call to them to follow him gripped them and they they did that they followed now he's going to take them into some territories now think try to be for a moment one of the twelve They would go to synagogue and sit and learn. They were basically the ones who were told what to do. They were, they were the ones who, who watched, but never watching with any intention of doing. Judaistic religion was, was in many respects a spectator sport. If you were not part of the religious leadership, your unholy hands were not allowed to touch holy things. I would, I would venture to say at this point in the ministry, none of these disciples had ever handled a scroll. They were kept in the purview of the synagogues. There were not that many of them. But Jesus goes into the synagogue. He takes them with him. Now the custom was that in synagogue services, if a visiting rabbi was there, then he would be invited to say some things. There would be in synagogue worship a, a, a time of praise to God, uh, then a prayer, followed by a scripture reading, and then it would, would finish with an exposition from the Old Testament, from one of the scrolls. You remember one of the accounts he is handed a scroll from Isaiah, and Luke's gospel records this, where he comes in, he's in Nazareth, he's a, he's a guest in the synagogue, Nazareth is his hometown, word has gotten around that he's a rabbi, that he has people following him, that he, his teaching is incredible, his, his deeds are remarkable. So they hand him the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads from Isaiah chapter 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good tidings, to, to do this, he, to heal the sick, to, to raise up, and on and on and on. And then he finishes the scroll, and he says, today this portion of scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> in other words, I'm, I'm the one that's talking about it. And of course they pressed upon him, carried him outside, wanted to throw him off a cliff, and he walked right through them. Didn't do anything to him. So here he is. Recognized as guest rabbi. Reads from a portion of scripture. We're not told in this, this account which one. But here's what we are told. They were astonished, verse 22, at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority. And here's the painful part of this. And not as the scribes. The scribes taught. But apparently, the, the scribes taught sort of almost a second hand. It was something they'd heard, something they'd been told. Now, folks, there's, there's a principle here for us. And it is not that you need to come up with something new and clever so that folks think that you have some sort of unique authority. That's not it at all. But when you and I speak about God, speak about the Word of God, we ought to tie our, our thoughts to the Word of God, but we ought to speak as someone who has authoritatively experienced that. As we go around telling Jesus, telling people who Jesus Christ is and what he has done, for sinners, there's, there must be that element and what difference that has made in our own lives. If we would call people to be changed by the gospel, then we must manifest to change ourselves. That's how we apply the fact that the Son of God speaks with authority and not as the scribes. One writer says the people were thunderstruck. His teaching had a way of moving people outside of their mundane world, giving them a sight of a better kingdom, of a hope, a taste of new wine. And then, and then a writer says, the master's teaching was not dry, dead, and hard to understand like the typical message from the rabbinical pulpit. My, my friend Ernie Reisinger, who's gone to be with the Lord now, he used to, he used to really chide us uh, years ago when we were younger and he would he would remind us if we were going to preach at a founders conference or just, he said now feed the sheep 
not the giraffes. Don't try to impress people with, your, with what you know. Bring the Word of God. To the, in fact, he said your test ought to be, do children understand what you're saying? If they do, then everybody should get it. Jesus was able to take the profound and make it plain. Make that which would be dry otherwise and bring it to life. It's the challenge we have. It's a challenge that when we talk to people that our message will stir their hearts. You remember in Luke 24, 32, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, what they said when they were reflecting back upon having had the resurrected Jesus walk up and said, what are, you, what are you so grieved about? And what, Are you the only person around that doesn't know that, that Jesus, whom we thought was the Messiah, was crucified? And so he began to speak to them. Go back and read that 24th chapter of Luke. And here they're reflecting on it now. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Here's a challenge that we as disciples have. Here's the question we've got to honestly ask ourselves. Do our hearts burn when we read the word of God? Is it, is it just so many pages in a book that's a special book? Or is it living? Hebrews 4.12 says this, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. In other words, going to that which is indivisible. How do you divide the soul and spirit? Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God brings light. It exposes for those who are, who are followers of Christ, we thank God that the Word of God brings light that exposes. It gives us an opportunity to repent, to bear fruit of repentance. For those who are not real Christians, you can see this in the Pharisees, the leaders, the Word of God brought to, to search their hearts, uh, embarrassed them, incensed them. I was talking about a matter earlier today. This is something, folks, we can tell a lot about where we are with Jesus when we discover our sin or someone discovers it for us. Do we, do we justify our sin or do we remember that we've been justified by faith in Christ and therefore own our sin? Let me tell you something. I have never preached a message that wasn't laced with sin. My best efforts are mixed with sin. My best motives are mixed with sin. That's why I chuckle sometimes when people will look at you like, well, what do I have to repent for? Well, uh, if you want me to go first, I can. We're going to be here a while. Sit down. I mean, sin is mixed in all we do. We need to recognize that and own that. Does your heart burn within you when the Scripture is read? Do you, do you find these very encounters... These emotional encounters where you're at once cut to the heart at one and the same time encouraged and strengthened and, and, and get hope and joy and peace and believing. All these emotions should be ours when we encounter God in His Word. Jesus was a master of that. We see this education, the spiritual education of theirs beginning. This is what we call this 10-month training period. Come and follow me. And he's going to emphasize for them four of the five uh, fundamentals. The word, prayer, fellowship, and witnessing. He models for them worship as he goes into the synagogue. Isn't it interesting? The synagogue would be increasingly a place of hostility toward him. Because he was saying that all that they were studying was about him. In fact, after he dies and rises again and ascends to heaven... If you'll notice, study the ministry, the synagogue ministry of, of, of the apostles. They go to the synagogues. I mean, and they go with the threat of religious leaders turning them over to the Romans and saying, here's some more of this rabble-rousing crowd, these insurrectionists, and yet they go. They worship, corporate worship, is important to them even in a place that was hostile to them. And so it's a good principle for us. For, you know, 
If anybody had an excuse, this is colloquial now, if anybody had an excuse not to go to church, the disciples had an excuse not to go to church. It was dangerous for them. Yet they followed the example of their master. They attended synagogue until new churches were formed. Then they attended those churches. One writer talked about it that I was reading on this said that, that he, was, uh, he was very involved in basketball and just for more than a decade and a half drilled and drilled and drilled to, to become really good at basketball. And, and one day had an opportunity to play for a really uh, a team that, at a very advanced level. And so he was very curious, what, what, what's, what's their key? What's the key to them being so good at this level? And here's what he said. What does an accomplished group such as this practice every day? The fundamentals, dribbling, passing, shooting, rebounding. The fundamentals. And you see, the same is true in, in Christianity. No matter how advanced we become, no matter how long we've followed Christ, serve the Lord, we can never get away from the fundamentals. We never outgrow our need to, to be engaged in the Word, to be involved in prayer, to experience fellowship, real fellowship, and to engage in witnessing. And if those ever begin to leave us, then we will not be healthy spiritually. And the next thing we see in this synagogue, is that there's, there's some fascinating things that happen here in the synagogue. One is that, that they, met, they met every Sabbath in the synagogue. And I don't think what Jesus encounters here was, was a one-time deal. I think this man who was possessed with an evil spirit was a, probably a regular synagogue attender. Now think about this. And yet he had not been challenged enough by the word to evoke an adversarial response to the things of God. And Jesus comes in and speaks one time and we're told that this, uh, this man with an evil spirit cries out in verse 24, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It's, as a side note, it's fascinating that what the Pharisees spent... spent all, <laughs> All the time with Jesus' ministry trying to disprove and debunk, demons picked up on immediately. We know who you are. The Holy One of God. That is the, the, the Messiah. You're the Messiah. And so now, he's, he's again, he's modeling, he's teaching. The disciples are watching. They're sitting on the edge of their seats as he teaches with authority. And now he's going to bring that the Word of God is not just something that's intellectually stimulating and fascinating. It is that. But that the Word of God has application to real life situations. Jesus rebuked the demon. He came out of him with a shriek. And look how the disciples respond. Look at this. Verse 27. And they were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What is this? A new teaching with authority. In other words, a, a, a new kind of teaching. He wasn't going over new material. Jesus taught from the established Old Testament scrolls available in the synagogues of the day. But his, his speaking, his teaching had authority so that even the demons he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him now if we're disciples following Jesus day by day we need to recognize that this scripture we have is powerful you don't always see it by the way but Paul assures us that when in, in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and following, that when we speak the word of God, that the, God, the word of God going forth, by the way, God has not promised that every word that comes out of our mouth will not return void. I'm, I'm afraid a lot of words come out of my mouth return void. But every word of God that goes out of the mouth of God as we speak it will not return void. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and following that, that 
to those who are perishing, in other words, to those who are obstinate and refuse to consider the truthfulness of the gospel, that the word of God is a, is a stench of death to death. It is, it is increasingly offensive. You may know somebody like that. You've shared the gospel with them off and on over time, and it seems like when, when the matter comes up, in fact, sometimes without you saying a word, they become offended by you, offensive towards you, uh, because they expect you to offend them by sharing that, those, those nasty truths again. It is the stench of death unto death. It is a response. A non-response, what seems to be a casual response, a ho-hum response, is a response. It is a, it is a rejection that, that hardens the heart of the unresponsive person. But also to others, it's the aroma of life, to those who are, who are being saved. It's, it's sweetness. If you've ever seen that, you know what I mean. I've been in some situations, and I remember one man, I think I've told you about it before, he was at the, at the VA hospital in Shreveport, and was dying and he was the father of one of our members and she asked me if I'd go see him. He had been a hard man. He, he didn't have anything to do with the things of God, the people of God, the church of God. He just didn't. So I went by to see him and was dying and I said, could I read scripture with you? Well, if it makes you feel better, sure, read, read it. So I, so I read Psalm 23, read some Psalms to him and he sat there. I went by to see him again and sat down and just got to where I would go by to see him and just read the scriptures. Talk about the hope that we have in the scriptures, the hope we have in Christ, the scripture tells us that. And so, the day came as, as days unfolded to weeks. I was reading the scriptures one day to him. And all of a sudden, he began to weep. And this, been, this man had been a hard man. He began to weep. begin to cry out, oh God have mercy on me. God have mercy on me. <laughs> began to, to confess what a terrible sinner he'd been. And how he'd now folks, I didn't prompt any of that. I didn't walk him through the Romans road. I didn't lead him in the sinner's prayer. I, didn't, <laughs> I just read the scriptures to him and exhorted him to think about Christ and his need of Christ as he was coming to the edge of eternity. And the Lord just melted the man's heart. And I saw a man come to Christ on his deathbed. And, you know, you hear about deathbed conversions and all. But this was no, this was no that, take my hand and pray this prayer with me. None of that. Just the Word doing its work. We've got to have that kind of confidence in the Scripture. So people don't believe the Bible today. And what has that got to do with anything? Because, see, all we, if, if, we've got to believe the Bible. And we've got to believe that, that, the, that the gospel is the power of God to salvation of those who believe. And so we just keep, we read it, we share it. I, I love the Gideons, I've told you, because they, they have this, their motto now is send the word. Now you get the picture, don't you? We're, we're to send missionaries, we're to, we're to go into all the world. And they send the word, get the word out, because the word will do its work. And Jesus is teaching them that. They see this, that, the, that the scripture, the one who teaches with authority, applies that authority to the needs of life. We better be convinced of that. Anybody you think of, whatever need they have, we can bring the Word of God to bear, and it brings light on the matter, and, is, and will meet, by the Spirit's power, will meet that need. Got to be convinced of that for us. Got to be convinced of that for anyone we encounter. We don't know anybody beyond the reach of the Scriptures. So, uh, his, uh, his work substantiated his word, one fellow has said. And then you see this, this witnessing. He, he encounters this man in the synagogue that the scribes didn't even know was there. There's, you see some of this throughout the Gospels. That Jesus, Jesus becomes aware of needs that the scribes overlooked. And I'll tell you, this is something that really I've got to, be, got to guard my heart. So, honest with you, sometimes I get so busy in ministry that I just overlook needs that, that walk right in front of me. And Jesus was aware of that with, with, with keen eyes. And he's, he's teaching every bit of this to the disciples. Well, how do you know that? It shows up in Peter's memoirs when he dictates his memoirs to Mark. This, this made an impact. Peter wasn't, this wasn't being stenographed along the way. There was nobody writing a summary of everyday's work. This is Peter looking back 
sometime later and writing those things that Jesus did and Jesus was doing them he was teaching them as he went teaching them in the way we've got to be ready and willing to give a witness now there's a big debate and I've, I've, I've been on both sides of it and I've watched people in both sides of it the debate is well is your testimony sharing the gospel or is the gospel different uh, well the answer is yes the gospel is the good news that God rather than destroying all sinners because all sinners deserve to be destroyed sent Jesus Christ his only son to come and live among us live a perfect life so he's the law keeper he lives in the place of lawbreakers he dies in the place of lawbreakers he dies on the cross satisfying God's divine justice Absorbing the wrath of God, rising from the grave, so that those who believe in him will be saved. That's the gospel. That's the good news. It's, it's good news to people who know that they're perishing. So, yeah, share the gospel. But you know something what, what people want to know? See, if we, if they want to know, are you just trying to sell me something like folks came the other day trying to sell me a vacuum cleaner? Do you know what they were not able to denounce? When Jesus had risen and ascended on high and the disciples came out of the upper room and, and began to, to share the gospel, you know what they could not, they could not denounce, they could not discount. They could cast aspersion on whether or not Jesus was raised. The, they could not play down. They could not ca cast a cloud over the changed lives of these men and these women. So the testimony is important. Who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do? His person and his work? What difference, if any, has that made in my life? And what difference, if any, has it made in your life? When a person can't point to a difference the gospel's made in their lives, and they have every reason to wonder, to question, have I, have I ever received the gospel? Is it the power of God and the salvation for me? And so Jesus is teaching them this, uh, this life-changing gospel and the need to, uh, to witness. Now, he leaves the synagogue, verses 29 to 31. I need to, I need to get hurry in here. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay ill. Parenthetically, let me say, if Simon had a mother-in-law, then the, then the model for the Pope being a single man seems to unravel completely, doesn't it, right there? Simon had a mother-in-law. He had a wife somewhere in the scene. And immediately they, they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Now, said, more power. And the fever left her and she began to serve them. So again, there's, the disciples are watching this. They knew she had a, that she was ill because they were told that when they came in the house and they passed the word on to Jesus who encountered her. He heals her. Look at her response. She got up and began to serve them. One of the marks of having been raised from the dead by Jesus, having been healed, if you will, having been brought by the power of the gospel into a relationship with him is that you serve. It is, it's of the warp and woof of being a Christian. He's modeling it. He's showing them this. He'll show it to them again in a big way recorded in John 13 on the night that he's betrayed. He's about to go through that awful agony of the mock trials and the beatings and the scourgings and the crucifixion. He takes a towel and a wash basin and he washes their feet. He would tell them in Mark 10, 45 that we've just gone through recently on Sunday morning. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many. And so he calls upon us to serve. Peter's mother-in-law models what happens when you have a real encounter with Jesus. People can have a religious encounter uh, in a Baptist church and still be selfish and stingy and not think about serving. And, and, and really, big, if you listen, well, what's in it for us? What have you got for me? What have you got for my kids? What have you got for my family? Well, we're going somewhere that's got more for our family. What's that got to do with serving? So Jesus touches somebody else and they show what happens when you encounter Jesus. Well, verse 34 tells us he healed many 
who were sick with various diseases, that because his fame begins to spread, he cast out demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Why, some have asked, why does he put this gag order on these demons? And sometimes on people he's healed. Don't tell anyone how this happened. It's because Jesus was not going to be Messiah on their terms. Also, it proves to us that Jesus had no intention of becoming the greatest tent preacher to ever live. He could have commanded thousands. Think about it, folks. We've pointed this out before. He could have filled any place that could be filled in his day many times over with people coming to hear him teach and to watch him heal. His mission, however, is to preach the gospel and to pour himself into the lives of these disciples so that when he left, they would carry on the work. He was not a one-man show. The future of the communication of the gospel did not depend on him alone. And it's instructive to us that if we want to see Bethel grow in a healthy way, like I read almost, not every week, but almost every week about some large church. I read of one, it just breaks my heart because I know of this fellow. I don't know him personally, but I know the largest Baptist church in South Carolina. 20,000 members. And the pastor was removed because it's been discovered he's, he's an alcoholic. And make no mistake about it. Baptists can drive you to drink, all right? There's no, no doubt about it. But it's tragic. It's a, you see, it's tragic. Jesus was pouring himself into these disciples, these 11 men, so that when he left, they would be equipped and ready to do the same, to pour themselves into, into others. So he puts a gag order on the demons. And then verse 35, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. It's interesting and the disciples don't get this initially. They will, ultimately, because they're going to say to him, Lord, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples to pray. Prayer was how Jesus nourished his soul. It was his drawing apart. When the crowds were pressing in, again, when most people would say, Wow, now we, now's the time to strike. You've got them in your hands. They, they'll follow you anywhere. And he would draw them aside. In fact, the text tells us that uh, Peter and the others were frustrated. Verse 37, they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. What are they saying there? What, what's, what is not said in the text that they're really saying? What are you doing here wasting your time when everyone is looking? They want to know where you are. You, you're going to lose the momentum. They're going to stop looking in a little while. They're going to, they're going to go on some... Jesus is teaching them that we have a balanced Christian life. If you get drawn up in thinking that your responsibility is to meet every need you're made aware of, you will wear yourself out and the enemy of our souls will be sure that you will wear yourself out. He can line people up from here to New York City and back with needs and wear you out. And Jesus shows us that while we must be compassionate, we've got to, we've got to blend, we've got to balance taking in with giving out. Your own soul needs to be nourished. Now, there's, clearly there's two ditches to avoid. One is to become monastic and just think, well, it's just my, my responsibility is to take in, to take in, to take in, and you never give out. And, the, and a stream that only takes in and takes in and doesn't get out becomes a polluted stream. It's, 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 it's stagnant. But the other ditch to avoid is the always giving, 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 and then you, you, you experience what we call compassion fatigue, where where you become weary. Some people, I mean, it, it happens in, in different levels. But some, I've known some preachers that have nervous breakdowns. 
Christmas gave and gave and gave and gave and gave out. And it's, you won't have to search very far to read articles about ministerial burnout. There's nothing noble in that. Nothing noble in that. I do agree with the preacher that said I would rather wear out than rust out, but burnout should not be the, the way that happens. So Jesus shows them. It's important to have intake, to have, and remember, the, the word, yeah, communicate the word, but you better listen to the word too. There better be times when, when God speaks to you through his word and when you meditate upon his word in prayer and when you, when you engage him in prayer and you take your burdens to the Lord and you, you unburden. Because, let me tell you something, if somebody finds out you have a listening ear, which you should have as a believer, they will unload on you so that you'll need a dump truck to come dig you out, or an excavator to come dig you out. They will do that. You've got, to, you've got to listen to God. You've got to draw aside. You've got to have those times of nourishment in your life. And Jesus is teaching them here. Like I said, later on they'll pick this up. They'll catch this because they'll ask him to teach. They'll ask him to teach them to pray. But now at this stage, they're, they're puzzled. Why? Why would you choose now to get aside and pray? Man, the crowds are white hot. They're, they're hanging on every word. Why waste your time here? And then he does something else which, which had to further confuse them. Now the crowds are at a fevered pitch. Word is spread abroad. And he says in verse 38, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. I'm going to declare the gospel. These folks want to set me up. Can, do you think it would have been hard in the setting we're reading about here in Mark for him to have just announced himself as king of that village, king of that area? I don't think it would be hard at all. People have been exercised, demons cast out. Teaching was incredible. They had them on. All he needs to do is add, add a, a miraculous feeding and that would, be, that would be it. That's all it would take. And they would have gathered and had him as their king in their little village or their area and been completely happy to do it. Let's go to the next towns. That I may proclaim, remember, preach now. Preach for Jesus was not, I need to find a pulpit. No, it's the, it's the word caruso. It's the word proclaim. I've got to go proclaim there also. It's, that's why I came out. If you read in Acts chapter 9 when they were scattered by the persecution, those scattered by the persecution, the book of Acts tells us, went everywhere, carousoing the gospel. They, all the believers scattered went proclaiming the gospel. It's not, this is not about Jesus the preacher. This is about Jesus the disciple maker. And he's going to witness to others about the good news. Now, we're told that he went throughout Galilee, preaching their synagogues, casting out demons. So he, this, this example, we told you about one episode tonight. But remember, he's teaching them. They're following him around Galilee. He's going into the synagogues. This is being, this is being burned into their template here. You go into the synagogues. By the way, when he, when he ascends on high, they are invited into different synagogues. They preach on the porches of the synagogues. They, they will go wherever they can, as close as they can, to the gathering of the religious people to proclaim the gospel. And they'll be given opportunities to do that as well. I want to close with, with something I found that I thought was it's, just, it's, a, it's a, called a simple four-step plan for, for ministry decision-making. How do, you, how do you decide in ministry what you're going to engage in? First, this is, this, this is not mine, this is someone else's. First, set goals that are scripturally based. Okay? Think about when it comes to ministry, don't think about, don't think how the prevailing current thinks. I'm discipling one of our, our young men now during the week, and it's, I wish I had a camera behind me as his eyes just get this big looking at the scripture looking at modern so-called evangelism and realizing that what is 
what is considered here as standard and normative is absent from the scriptures. We're not talking about what the prevailing culture says is the way. What goals for ministry are scripturally based? Well, I think in this setting, in this place, first and foremost, is to be a disciple maker, to grow as a disciple so that we can be disciple makers who then engage in making other disciples who will grow and become disciple makers. That's why in the very near future we're going to pass around and, 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 and we've had it introduced, we're going to apply these life transformation groups. If you really want to be a disciple maker who makes disciple makers, this is going to be, I think, one of the most biblically based paths to do it. Jesus had 12. I don't think we can handle 12. Two or three, though, is a good number for us to gather with. And, and we're going to show you how to do that and, and encourage you to join us in that journey. Set goals that are scripturally based. Second, set priorities for the activities that are necessary to reach those goals. We ought to be honest enough to ask what we're contemplating doing. Does that move us closer to being disciple makers who make disciple makers? Or does that, does that become, even though it may be very good, a distraction from that? Priorities that support this. Third, develop a schedule that reflects the goals and priorities. What kind of time am I spending? If I say I want to be a disciple maker who makes disciple makers, but I'm not spending any time learning about that, which we're doing here, or engaging with others in that, then how can I say that that's a goal or that's a priority if it doesn't reflect itself in my schedule? And then fourth, discipline yourself to keep your schedule, which reflects your priorities, which will enable you to achieve your goals. It's really good, good practical advice for any kind of goal setting. Now notice, Jesus has taken these guys from catching fish to catching men. He takes them around the Sea of Galilee and they're being transformed by his teaching and his example. He packed an awful lot of learning into a very little time. And he anchors it all in the authority of Scripture. When, when, notice on Pentecost. All you got to do is go, go forward. What, what do they look like when Jesus is gone? Peter comes out of the upper room at Pentecost. And he, he begins to cite the prophets. He'd heard Jesus teach on the prophets. At least being drunk, and it's, it's early in the day. We are not drunk as you suppose. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And boom, he gives the prophecy of Joel. Then he cites the psalm. Then these guys that their message was to be anchored in the scripture and their scripture at that time before they started writing scripture was the Old Testament. It was, think about this, do you realize that the disciples that we're studying about, that their manual of evangelism was the Old Testament? They preached the gospel from the Old Testament. It shouldn't surprise us then when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you're going to find life. These, the Old Testament, testify of me. He was teaching the priority of prayer. The authority of Scripture, the priority of prayer. He prayed at the most inopportune times. He showed the importance of meeting needy people with the gospel. To teach them that their father's plan was for them to live their lives live the gospel as well as speak the gospel. So I close with this. The message from God, that is the scriptures, provoked a dialogue with God, that is prayer, and set forth in a message to others about God, witnessing. One of my professors in seminary said it. He said, I think we would talk more to men about God, men and women and boys and girls, if we talked more to God about the people with whom we need to talk concerning the gospel. If we spent more time with God praying for the lost whom we know, we would be compelled, as John Stott says, to spend more time talking with the lost about the gospel of God. 
That's how Jesus taught. That's how he taught his disciples to teach. That's why by well, the time you get to Paul writing to Timothy, the things that you've heard from me, Paul says, in the presence of many witnesses, you proclaim the same thing to others who themselves will be able to, others who are faithful, and whose faithfulness is proven by the fact that they themselves will communicate the same to others. Peter got it. Paul got it. He said, as one out of, born out of due season. John got it. James got it. They understood. We should too. We should know. We should do. I think sometimes my problem is that I need knowledge of truth to move about, I don't know what this is, 12 inches south and grip my heart. I need to be compelled to do what I know. Let's pray. To Heavenly Father, we, we look at this and Jesus' teaching was not uh, flashy. In fact, you could, you could, it wasn't even formal. It was, uh, it was as he went. Lord, help us to be as you go disciples. As we go, help us to realize that we're, we're always teaching somebody something. If anybody's paying any attention to us at all, we're always teaching them something. Help us to be introducing people to just how authoritative in our lives and powerful the Word of God is in our lives. How critical prayer is. How inevitable witnessing is when, when the Word of God is authoritative and prayer is critical. How important fellowship is and how delightful worship is. Help, help us to show that and speak that. And point men and women and boys and girls to Jesus with our lips and with our lives. Help us to get it like the early disciples did. To become disciples who are disciple makers engaging others to see them become disciples who themselves will be disciple makers. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's talk a few minutes.